important factors in the selection of nearly all diving equipment. There is a particular group of equipment items, however, for which comfort and fit are so important that most dive educators feel you should own these items personally and not gamble on being able to borrow or rent ones that are the right size, shape, and style. These items include your mask, your snorkel, a pair of adjustable fins, and your wetsuit boots. Another item that's important to your personal comfort and for which fit is a critical factor is your exposure suit and its related accessories. These are the items we'll be discussing in this section. As you'll remember from earlier in the course, masks allow you to see underwater by creating an airspace in front of your eyes which allows them to focus. Almost any mask you select for scuba diving will incorporate a number of features, including a soft silicone skirt that also incorporates a secondary inner skirt to help ensure a better seal, a frame that joins the skirt to a single or multi-piece tempered glass lens, although some newer masks do without the frame entirely. Special buckles that let you adjust strap length for proper fit. And an easily accessible nose pocket that lets you pinch off your nose so that you can equalize the pressure in your ears. The single most important feature any mask can have is a proper fit. To make sure that a mask fits you properly, begin by looking up, pulling your hair out of the way, and letting the mask rest against your face. The mask skirt should touch evenly all around. Now inhale through your nose and hold your breath. The mask should stick firmly in place, and you shouldn't hear the sound of air escaping any place. Only when you exhale should the mask drop away. Another desirable feature in mass is a wide field of vision. There are two ways to accomplish this. One is to incorporate small side windows in the frame of the mask. The other method is to utilize a wide lens that sits close to the face. This creates what is known as a low volume mask. It has the added benefit of low drag, lightweight, and there's less water to clear from the mask should you accidentally flood it. Which style is best for you? Well, that's something you can only determine by trying on a number of masks and seeing which mask best meets your individual needs. A desirable option for any mask is a replacement strap made from neoprene foam, the same material used to make wetsuits. These make donning masks easier and they tend to pull less on long hair. Okay, let's say you normally wear glasses or contacts. What do you do when you go diving? A number of divers who wear gas permeable contact lenses above water simply continue to wear them underwater. If you choose to go this route, however, it's important to remember to close your eyes should you accidentally get water in your mask, otherwise you risk losing those contacts. If this is not an option for you, ask your SDI dive center about having your prescription put inside your mask. You should always transport and store your mask inside a protective case. If your mask doesn't come with such a case, you can purchase one separately. Another investment you should make is a small bottle of defogging solution. This will help prevent your mask from fogging up during dives. Before using your mask for the first time, you'll need to thoroughly clean the inside to remove the protective coating that's applied to the lens during the manufacturing process. If you don't do this, your defog won't be effective. Use a non-abrasive cleaner, such as dishwashing detergent, and plenty of hot water. This process may take up to three to five minutes or more. You'll know when your mask is sufficiently clean because your fingers will make a loud squeaking noise as you work them over the surface of the lens. The secret to applying defog is to do so while the lens is still dry. 
You'll only need a small quantity, but you'll want to use your fingers to work it into all surfaces of the lens. Once you're done applying defog, rinse the mask just slightly to remove any excess. Once you've done this, keep the inside of the mask as dry as possible to avoid accidentally rinsing out the remaining defog. Snorkels allow you to see what's going on below you while resting or swimming at the surface without having to use any air from your scuba cylinder. A snorkel is something that every scuba diver should own and know how to use, if for no other reason than it allows you to go snorkeling between scuba dives. The snorkels most divers use incorporate a number of features. For example, the tip of most snorkels is equipped with some sort of baffle or deflector, which is designed to help keep water out at the surface and may reduce the amount of water that gets into the barrel during breath hold dives. Some snorkels are even equipped with special dry valves, which keep water entirely out of the snorkel while breath hold diving. A critical feature on any snorkel is the snorkel keeper, which is designed to attach the snorkel to the left side of the wearer's mask. Scuba divers wear their snorkels on the left so that they won't interfere with the regulator second stage, which comes from the right. It's also common to mount the snorkel toward the back of the mast strap so that as you look down, the snorkel is pointing straight up. Some snorkels are equipped with a flexible mouthpiece. This helps the mouthpiece drop out of the way when the snorkel's not in use so that it won't interfere with the regulator second stage. Almost every snorkel these days comes with a one-way valve at its base. When you breath hold dive, it's normal for the barrel of your snorkel to fill with water. When you return to the surface, gravity will cause a great deal of this water to drain out through the one-way valve. This reduces the amount of water that you have to clear from the snorkel before you can resume breathing by roughly half. Many divers prefer not to wear a snorkel attached to their mask because of the drag and distraction that snorkels can create. Folding snorkels give you the option to carry a snorkel with you at all times without it necessarily having to be attached to your mask. Fins serve an important function by allowing you to move efficiently underwater with minimal effort. Fins come in two basic styles, full foot fins and adjustable fins. Full foot fins get their name from the fact that the pocket encloses your entire foot. You may already own a pair of full foot fins, which you purchase to go snorkeling in warm water. Full foot fins are well suited for this because of their flexibility and ease of use. When it comes to scuba diving, however, full foot fins have some serious limitations. To start, all but the most expensive full foot fins lack sufficient size and stiffness to overcome the additional drag of scuba equipment or allow you to keep up with other divers. Because they are designed to be worn over bare feet, Full foot fins cannot provide adequate thermal protection for water below about 20 degrees centigrade or about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Finally, although full foot fins are fine for diving off smooth boat decks in warm water, in fact, you'll see a number of resort dive masters use very high quality full foot fins for just this purpose. Full foot fins cannot provide you with adequate protection when diving off of rocky beaches or rough, uneven surfaces. The better choice for most scuba divers are adjustable fins, which are designed to be worn with wetsuit boots. When diving with adjustable fins, it's your wetsuit boots that provide the necessary protection against cold, sharp objects, or rough, uneven surfaces. The fins provide the necessary thrust. Although nearly any pair of adjustable fins will prove adequate for scuba diving, there are some features you should be aware of which may help you to choose one pair of fins over another. The strap and buckle assembly will typically allow you to tighten fins by pulling on the tips of the straps, 
or remove them by activating a quick release mechanism. Make sure that whatever pair of fins you choose, you can both tighten and remove the fins easily. Some divers prefer the additional convenience afforded by straps made from stainless steel springs. These are standard on some fins and available as an aftermarket accessory on others. Better quality fins will incorporate some form of blade enhancement technology designed to give you more thrust with less effort. These will range from special vent holes to flexible panels to blade designs that emulate a marine animal's tail. Among the most popular forms of blade enhancement technology are what are known as split or propeller fins. These work to a large degree by allowing a greater percentage of the blade area to form an oblique angle to the water. You should purchase both your wetsuit boots and your fins at the same time, as it's important these fit both your feet and each other. Select your wetsuit boots first, based on factors such as comfort and fit. Once you've settled on a pair of wetsuit boots, try a variety of fins on over them. As with your wetsuit boots, you'll want your fins to fit snugly, but not be uncomfortably tight. Your mask, snorkel, wetsuit boots and adjustable fins represent an investment that you'll want to protect by transporting and storing in a proper container. One good choice is a mesh backpack or duffel bag. This should be large enough to accommodate not only your mask and fins but also a BC regulator and lightweight wetsuit. While learning to dive you can use this bag to transport your mask and fins safely to and from the pool. Later on, as you travel, you can use this same bag to transport all your dive gear from your hotel room to the dive boat. In the last part of this section, we'll discuss a variety of equipment bags and how you can use them as an integrated system to transport, store, and protect your dive equipment. Your BC is a multi-purpose tool that performs a variety of important functions. To start, it's the harness that holds your scuba cylinder and regulator system securely to your back. Its inflatable air cell allows you to compensate for exposure suit compression at depth and to float or swim effortlessly at the surface with your head above water. Its integrated weight system holds the ballast you'll need to offset your body's natural buoyancy and that of your exposure suit and other equipment. BCs come in two basic styles. Wraparound or jacket style BCs have air cells that are actually part of the harness assembly and partially surround the diver. The air cells of back inflation BCs are largely separate from the harness and are sandwiched between the diver and his scuba cylinder. No matter which style you choose, your BC will incorporate a number of features. The power inflator button will let you inflate the BC using air from your cylinder at the surface or underwater. The oral inflation button allows you to inflate the BC in the unlikely event of power inflator failure. This same button is also the most common means of venting air from the BC. You simply hold the inflator up and push the button while at the same time turning your body so that the hose elbow is the highest point on the BC. Most BCs also have a remote exhaust valve that you activate by pulling down on the inflator hose. Many BCs have adjustable shoulder straps with slide release buckles. They may also have an additional exhaust valve located on the back of the shoulder or waist that you activate by means of a pull cord. The cam band is what attaches your cylinder to the BC harness. A number of BCs incorporate pockets, which are a handy place to store gloves, slates, 
backup lights, and other items. Nearly all recreational PCs sold these days incorporate some form of quick-release weight pockets. Accessory D-rings on the shoulder straps and elsewhere provide a convenient attachment point for alternate air source second stages, instrument consoles, and other equipment. Among the very first skills you'll need to master as a diver is how to properly assemble your scuba unit. Before we get into that, however, we need to take a minute and talk about scuba cylinder safety. When full, your scuba cylinder contains enough explosive energy to lift a fire truck over one meter up in the air. A scuba cylinder that is knocked over or falls over accidentally can suffer catastrophic valve damage. This can lead to a scuba cylinder that's spinning wildly out of control, a literal rocket that can not only damage other items, it can cause very serious personal injury. When you visit your local SDI dive center, you'll most likely see a number of cylinders standing upright. What you may not be aware of, however, is that these cylinders are almost always tucked in a corner or standing with other cylinders up against a wall where the odds of them being knocked over are fairly slim. One place where you won't see cylinders standing upright unattended is on dive boats. Instead, you'll see cylinders properly stowed securely in special storage racks or, barring this, lying flat on the deck and blocked so they don't roll. One habit you'll want to develop early on is never leaving a cylinder standing unattended. If you must leave a cylinder unattended, lay it on its side. If you've already assembled your scuba unit, lay it so that the equipment is on top and won't be damaged by the weight of the tank. Before you begin, if you have the opportunity, soak your cam band in water. This will allow it to stretch and reduce the likelihood of the tank accidentally slipping. On yoke style valves, you'll want to inspect the valve o-ring. You should have a smooth, shiny appearance and not be dried up, cracked, shredded, nicked, or otherwise damaged. Replace any worn or damaged o-rings before continuing. To start, orient the cylinder so that the valve orifice is facing away from you. This helps ensure that the regulator's second stage hoses will be on your right and the instruments and low pressure inflator hose will be on your left. Next, slip the BC cam band over the top of the cylinder and lower it into place. The BC should be on the same side of the cylinder as the valve orifice. Position the BC so that the top of the shoulders are roughly the same height as the tank valve. Later, you can check to make sure that the cylinder is low enough so that the regulator doesn't hit you in the head, but high enough so that you can reach back and access both second stage hoses. If need be, you can raise or lower the cylinder at that time and make a note of this position for future use. To lock the BC firmly in place, pull out as tight as you can on the cam band. Now fold the cam buckle over halfway and insert the tip of the cam band through the tip of the buckle. Once you've done this, fold the buckle over the rest of the way. You should both hear and feel it snap into position. As a final check, push up and down firmly on the cam band to make certain it's as tight as possible. Now remove the dust cap from the regulator first stage and orient the regulator so that the second stage is around the right and the instruments and BC inflator hose are on the left. The first stage should be turned so that the first stage inlet is pointing directly at the cylinder valve outlet. Mate these two openings together and then turn the yoke screw or DIN connector until they are just finger tight. Before going any further, connect the low pressure inflator hose 
to the BC power inflator. Before turning the air on, pick up the submersible pressure gauge and make sure it's pointing down and away from you or anyone else. When you're ready, turn the air all the way on. Now look at the pressure gauge and confirm that the cylinder indeed has sufficient air for the planned dive. You should next take several breaths from both second stages to confirm that they are functioning properly. While you do this, look at the pressure gauge. The pressure should not be dropping or fluctuating at all while you breathe. If you've not done so already, your final step should be to secure your alternate air source second stage in a proper retainer and to clip off your instrument console or pressure gauge to one of your accessory D-rings so that it won't dangle freely. The last thing you and your buddy should do before entering the water is run through the ABC checklist. This will help ensure that the three pieces of equipment most critical to your safety and health are in working order and ready to enter the water. The A in the checklist stands for air. You and your buddy need to reach back and check to make certain that the other's air is turned on. Bear in mind though that divers sometimes mistake right from left and accidentally turn a buddy's air off when they think they're turning it on. Therefore, as a backup to this procedure, you should each take several breaths from your regulator while looking at the pressure gauge. The pressure should not fluctuate as you breathe, nor should it drop with each breath. If it does, you need to stop and have your buddy make sure that your air is turned completely on in the right direction. The B in the checklist stands for BC. As a general rule, you'll want to have your BC at least partially inflated before entering the water. As a minimum, you should check to make sure that your inflation and deflation controls are functioning correctly. The C on the checklist stands for computer. Make sure yours is activated, that there is no low battery indicator showing, and if you're diving a gas mixture other than air, that the PO2 setting is correct. That last point is something we cover in greater detail in the Nitrox Diver course. Now you're ready to don the rest of your equipment and enter the water. Even masks that fit properly will occasionally leak. Fortunately, there's a simple method that will allow you to remove any water that gets into your mask without having to surface. If you understand how air, pumped into an inverted glass underwater, displaces the liquid inside, you know how this method works. To practice this skill, you'll need to start with a mask that's either partially or fully flooded. The easiest way to accomplish this is to insert a finger underneath the skirt at the top of the mask. Next, press in with one or both hands at the top of the mask frame. This forms a seal along the top and sides of the mask so that water can only exit out the bottom. While continuing to press in at the top of the mask, begin exhaling a steady stream of bubbles out your nose. If it takes more than just a single breath to get all the water out of your mask, no problem. Use all the air you need. Just before you exhale, the final breath needed to completely clear your mask, look up. This will make the bottom of your mask skirt the lowest point and help you to get all the water out. As a final note, if you wear contacts, keep your eyes closed anytime there's water in your mask. This will help you prevent accidentally losing your lenses.
One of the things you'll learn as part of your course is how to deal with a buddy who may be too tired to swim or may be suffering from a leg cramp. If you are at the surface, remember that the first rule is to establish positive buoyancy. If your buddy's unable to do this, you can assist by approaching from the rear and using your buddy's power inflator or orally inflating her BC. Among the easiest ways to tow a tired diver is to use what is known as the tank pole. To do this, you simply grab your